when she came to study in the capital. It's not only her I'm proud of. There is the story of the unspoken heroes, about the story of women who never make the books. And I'm going to share three stories with you. The first one is a story of a woman from a small village in Kosovo. During the terrible war in 99, in the small village of Kusha, the entire male population was, was killed during, as part of the ethnic cleansing campaign. And the only ones who survived were women and their children. <clears throat> but these women, they didn't cry. They didn't seek revenge. They were not called for hatred. They rolled up their sleeves. They started working their land. And because of them, that tiny little village in Kosovo it is no longer known only for its tragic past. That village is also a sign and a symbol of rebirth and survival. Today, those women have joined their forces. They have opened small farms, small businesses. And if you ever get to Kosovo, please ask for Kusha pickles. They are very nice. The other story I want to share is the story of the women that were raped during the war. 20,000 women were raped in Kosovo, and for a country with a population of 1.8 million, it's a very large number. But they also didn't fade in despair. They did not ask for revenge. Actually, one of them publicly stated, revenge and hatred is a very heavy burden to carry. I want to work for my sisters. I want to make sure they have proper health insurance. I want to make sure they have support. And it actually took a woman to become the president of the nation in order for, her, for their voices to be heard. And the third story I want to share is the story of my impact in Mandy. You know, only last year, we finally managed to compete in the Olympics under our own flag. And guess what? We got a medal. A golden one. And it was won by a young woman. And can you guess in what category? Judo. <laughs> so if you say to a woman in Kosovo, fight like a girl, it has a very specific meaning. You're going to get into that. So the women in Kosovo, be it president, ministers, members of the parliament, Presidents of the Supreme Court. They are all women in Kosovo, by the way. The, the story of Kosovo, the story of women in Kosovo, could have never been told without brave men. Yay, brave men. We need brave men. We need courageous yes. men to work hand in hand with us to tell our story, to inspire our daughters, to inspire our nieces, our friends. And that's what Richard is. Richard is a 
an amazing author, but also a very great one. We need more men engaged, and we need more men writing the legacy of women in politics. And Richard is not only a great writer, he is a human rights activist and an educator. More importantly, he's a father. He's a father of a beautiful young girl who will have limitless dreams because she's smart, She's beautiful, and she has a father to support her. We need more men like Richard, because we need to tell the story that feminism and women empowerment, to quote one of your very prominent ladies in politics, is not only the right thing to do, but it is also the smart thing to do. You know? We need men like Richard in order for the world to understand that we will prosper. We will make tremendous steps ahead only when we become gender blind. Thank you very much. Uh, researching the book and 
Uh, it's a book about other women and 108 of them, so. <laughs> lastly, I'd like to thank my mother, who obviously can't be here. She is no longer with us. Uh, my mother had an outlandish, uh, she, she said she loved my brain, and that gave me an outlandish sense of confidence and uh, thought that I could do anything. Uh, and that outlandish confidence uh, far outpaces my actual abilities. So thank God she did that. All right. About a year ago, I took my children bowling, uh, Annalise and John. And I am contractually obligated every time I mention Annalise's name because they're twins to mention John's name as well. <laughs> I took them bowling, and Annalise did something very interesting. First of all, most of you uh, know what a kitty ramp is. If you have wee ones, you put a kitty ramp up, you put the ball in there, and then it goes down on its own. Annalise shook off the kitty ramp, grabbed the bowling ball, ran around the kitty ramp with a ball as big as her whole body, and launched it towards the pit. She struck a superhero pose and proclaimed to the entire bowling alley, I'm a leader. <laughs> that's Annalise. She very much is a leader, that's her 100%. She runs the house. Now, this was just a momentary thing, and actually, I caught her the second time she did it. I caught her the second time she did it. Second time, there we go, that's her doing it. So, I started researching books on women presidents and prime ministers. There hadn't been one written for 12 years. And that's 55 women presidents and prime ministers that, that had come to mind. So I decided, well, you know, I'm an editor, I'm, I'm a writer. How, how difficult could it be? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a couple months, it was a whole year. It was difficult. But what happened was I learned some things that I don't think many people are aware of. Uh, and I think it's uh, some of the things that I've learned have to get out there. And so that's why I'm here this evening. Just another word about Annalise before I move on. Uh, a few months later, it was election night, I was typing away on the manuscript, and when the returns came in for West Virginia, with Trump at 79% first returns, I literally stopped typing mid-sentence. Put my PC away, and I didn't know whether I should complete the book. I mean, after all, the book was time to come out with a female president, and most of us expected. So, Annalise comes up to me the next day, and the next day was like a, a tomb. It's like a funeral in our house. We're very democratic. And she comes up to me and she says, don't worry, Daddy. She hides me. She pats my hand and she says to me, don't worry. I said, well, what, what do you mean? She goes, I'll be Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a kid that deserves a book, and that's, uh, that's So tonight I'm going to tell you my conclusions of my research, uh, and I'm going to tell you exactly why women leaders on the whole have been great, uh, why they do a fantastic job, what their stumbling blocks are, why the United States lags behind most nations in women's leadership. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how I believe we can fix that. Let's start with some statistics. A little water, dry, and then we'll start. statistics. <laughs> so, all right. There we go. Okay, so when I was a young man, you know, when most of you were younger, uh, there were about half a dozen women leaders that were well known. Paul Meyer, Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, uh, the Dear Gandhi, Bhutto, uh, uh, Aquino, right? Well, since then, uh, there have been 108 women that have been president or prime minister. And that's, that's a huge change. That's a lot of people, a lot of water in the bridge. Uh, currently, there are 18 women in office right now, and that's, that's a step in the right direction. Uh -oh. Okay, well, let's start here. Uh, there's been a 400% increase since the 1980s till this decade, and we're not even done with this decade. So there are eight or nine in the 70s, eight or nine in the 80s, uh, and then in the 2010s, we're at 44, and we're not done with the decade. The 18 women leaders uh, that are in office right now are remarkable, but though that's progress, they represent only 9% of the world leaders. Progress, but not so much progress as you would hope for. Now let's do a quick rundown. In Europe, they have 44 prime ministers and presidents. I'm so sorry about the power of Ariel. 
In Asia, they have 24. In, uh, they have had 24. In Africa, they have had, we'll wait for it to catch up, 15. Now this is remarkable because Africa is universally panned as not having much uh, female leadership, and yet they have. In Central America and the Caribbean, they have had, that's actually 11 now, uh, women leaders that have been president or prime minister. In South America, there have been eight. In the Pacific Rim, including Australia and New Zealand, there have been four. And in North America, there have only been two. The two are Alekwa Hammond of Greenland, which is not independent for one year, and Kim Campbell of Canada for four months, which is not really a long time. So though we've had two, we are way, way behind the rest of the world. Okay, so fact number one, North America compares poorly to the rest of the world with regards to women leadership. This, to me, is stunning. Fact number two, the women who the leaders come from amazingly diverse backgrounds. They have been accountants, they've been biologists, they've been chemists, they've been doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, guerrilla fighters, and stay-at-home moms. They've been flight attendants and dancers. That's diversity, and that's important for a couple reasons. The diversity is important because it brings to the table perspectives that aren't there. It brings vulnerable populations and people that are missed uh, to the table, and it represents them. So let's talk about a couple of the stories. Sarah Kudangelwa of Namibia, the Namibia ambassador tried to be here tonight but could not make it. She was an accountant. At 27 years of age, she worked in the president's office and she said she did such a great job uh, with the, the numbers because she was an accountant that they put her in charge of the budget at 27 years of age. She became finance minister. She is now the president of the prime minister of Namibia, ran the first surplus anyone has ever run in balance of books of Namibia, first time in Namibia history. <laughs> so Natasha Mitchell, she was supposed to be a temporary president of Serbia, but she ended up serving for two years during the constitutional crisis. She is the face that redefines, okay. She is the face that redefines what, what it is to be a what it is to be a president. She was young, she was youthful, she was straightforward and honest. Two years prior to her being sworn in, she was driving around meeting the anti Milosevic protest. She was an activist in a car painted Thelma and Louise. <laughs> An activist, two years before becoming president. So women really do come from all walks of life. Kirsty Casale, one of my favorites, she ran a power plant. Angela Merkel, I bet some of you didn't know that she was a quantum chemist. I don't know what a quantum chemist does, but you know she's got brains. Amina Green Fakim of the Mauritius, love this story. She gave a TED talk about her biomedical park. And uh, what she does is she talks about the flora and the fauna of the Indian Ocean, because it's islands off the East Coast. They're looking for cures to cancer using those indigenous plants. They're building uh, structures for antibiotics that, were, uh, that are plant-based. Uh, they've also found proteins and all sorts of stuff. So she's talking on TED about that. They have a constitutional crisis in 2015 in the Mauritius. And some of the guys, some of the people in church says, what about uh, Amina Garib Fakim? What, what about her for president? They drafted her. She is now the president of the country. And she's got the largest soapbox. She talks to leaders all over the world about the issues that are important to her. Healing people. Sure, you can get I like my problem. But behind me, an educator. When she took office, she thought that she'd be doing budgets and that she'd be doing international relations. No. She is doing publicity to tell people that her islands are sinking. The Marshall Islands are disappearing. People are fleeing the Marshall Islands. So she has become one of the world's greatest spokespersons for global warming. That education background comes in handy. So we see that women are diverse. 
what do they accomplish? What issues do they focus on when they get into office? Well, I bet you, and I didn't want to do it at the TEDx because it's not that kind of a lecture, but throw up a hand. What do you think are the top six issues that women work on? Come on, take a guess. Anyone? Anyway. Health. Health care. Bingo. Education. What else? Education. What else? Health. Climate change. Climate, global warming, yes, the environment, and? Childcare. Childcare with education. So, women protect women, number one, children, number three, healthcare, number four, and the environment, number five. Number two, peace building and national reconciliation. They are such a universal force for good. There have been 108 women that have been presidents and prime ministers. There are maybe a half a dozen that really didn't focus on this, that were more militaristic or focused on other things, uh, but at least 95% of these women have focused on those issues. That's huge. Peace builders. Oh, these are the issues. The peace building, uh, there are several women that come to mind. There are dozens of them. Uh, Benjamin, Bender, not, uh, Benjamin Dari is one of my favorites. So she was a leader of the communist uh, movement when the monarchy decided that it would allow democracy to come and the constitution would be written. Uh, Bidya had lost her husband in a tragic accident and she started descending even further up the communist party. When they needed to bring in the Maoist guerrillas, because there was a Maoist insurgency, you can't really have an all-inclusive democracy if there's a massive insurgency going on. She was part of the group that brought the insurgency in, there was negotiations, they disarmed, they integrated, and then people turned around and said, boy, we'd love to have her as president. Her condition for becoming president was to write into the new constitution the woman's mandate, a 30% quota of women in the legislation at all times. She did that. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, if I overstated it, you, you can correct me. Violetta de Chamorro. Okay, well. Good quote from Yingluck Shinawatra, the recently deposed Prime Minister of Thailand. The Violetta de Chamorro, you may never have heard of. She was the first freely elected Nicaraguan president. Many of us remember Daniel Ortega from the Cold War. He had won the, the uh, Civil War, and he called the first free and fair elections. Ran against her. She was left of center as well. She ran the Love Prenza newspaper. And she put together, cobbled together a 19-party uh, coalition that defeated Daniel Ortega. Then she went out of her way to make friends with him. Who does that? Thank you. They literally became very good friends. And that picture there is the picture of a national reconciliation. As they healed, so too did the nation. Atifati Janjara, and I know I'm going to get heck for mispronouncing it, uh, has a quote that says, women are an inseparable part of the comprehensive progress of society. They're agents of peace, of conflict resolution, of state building, and their direct involvement ensures a safer and a more just world for everyone. Kosovo, whose ambassador you heard from, is a, a, a nation that's leading uh, on women's issues. Uh, as you also heard from the ambassador, Jajara was a police officer, rose to the, the head of the police department, uh, ran for office, and won the presidency. It, it was remarkable, because here's a nation that had just been through so much. And we've seen this time and time again. When Rwanda went through what they went through, the women leaders came in. When Serbia went through what they went through, the women